So today we, did, we do then continue our message, Foundations of the Faith. And again, the reason why we wanted to go this route is because our world is a confusing place. And it seems like there's not a week that goes by, but that something, uh, you know, a, a traditional value is being challenged, a way of doing things is being questioned, and time-honored, uh, you know, values are being set aside. It's a world of confusion. If there was ever a time that the church needs to know what we believe and why we believe it, that time is now. So far in the series, we've examined the inspiration and authority of the scriptures, the nature of the Trinity, the deity and ministry of Jesus Christ, the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the plight of man, and the remedy of God. And that brings us to this morning's message, The Glorious Church. We begin by taking a look at our statement of faith in these regards. It says, We believe that the true church is composed of all such persons who through saving faith in Jesus Christ have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and are united together in the body of Christ of which He is the head. Our text for this morning's message is taken from Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1 it says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, today we ask that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read, as the word is proclaimed, that we may with joy receive what you would say to the church today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's March, which means college basketball has taken center stage. Of course, last month was the Super Bowl. And that marked the end of the NFL season. And, uh, you know, before you get too down in the mouth, I just want to remind you that two weeks from tomorrow is Major League Baseball opening day. <laughs> I figured I'd get an amen for that one. <laughs> but you know what? Regardless of what sport you're talking about, there's something that I find interesting because it seems like there are athletes in every sport who will regularly gesture to heaven. Have you noticed it? You know, maybe it's a touchdown and they'll, you know, say a little quick prayer and point skyward. Or maybe it's the home run hit or whatever, you know, and they come in waving one finger above their head, you know, saying that they give praise to God. Maybe they uh, do the sign of the cross or something. And they have various expressions, but it seems like there is this inherent understanding that uh, God's throne is high and lifted up, that God dwells in heaven. And of course, we know that, you know, the planet is round and so up for us is down for the people in China at any given time, right? And yet, we also understand that heaven is high and lifted up in the sense that God's throne uh, transcends creation, that it is high and exalted. Of course, Paul refers to the glorious seat of Christ's rule as in the heavenly realms, far above all principalities and power, that Jesus has been given a name that is above every name, that it's in the heavenly realms from where Christ rules. Sports stories aside, we celebrate the Lord's heavenly rule. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He reigns from on high. He is far above every principality, every power, every rule and authority and dominion. 
His name is above every name. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And so it's true. The Lord Jesus Christ rules from on high. And yet, there is a way in which today's text would have us to think about the practical application of God's presence in this world. That yes, He is high and lifted up, but He wants to be near and involved in the affairs of man. That He is transcendent, and yet He is, as the songwriter said, as close as the mention of His name. That He is the God who is near. The parakletos, the Holy Spirit, is one who walks beside. And uh, Jesus even said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you to the very end of the age. In other words, what the scriptures teach about the dwelling place of God is not only that it is high and lifted up, but that it's also near unto us through the church. And so with that in mind today, I want to talk about the church and take a close look at what the church is. We're going to consider its makeup, its mission, and its ministry. But before we get too heavily involved in it this morning, I want to just give a little bit of a background as to the text that Paul writes to the church of Ephesus. Of course, he's writing from prison, and for Paul, that's pretty common. His audience is the Christians of Ephesus and the Christians of Asia Minor. The congregation is comprised of Greeks and Persians, Romans, Jews. Like America, in many regards, the Roman Empire was a melting pot of society. It was made up of diverse cultures and diverse languages and even diverse religions. And these various influences complemented each other and they also clashed with each other. What brought them together? The Roman Empire. As Rome exerted its military might, traditions of the peoples were challenged. Alliances were shifted. Many were uprooted and scores of people were disenfranchised, especially people that were at the bottom of the social ladder. Of course, the official line was that peace ruled. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace. The borders were certainly secured by the emperor's armies. Rome had a formidable military power. But peace came at a price. Taxes were burdensome. Tributes were an annoyance. And yet, the powerful Roman influence continued to guarantee the security of the people. There were stronger armies. There were taller and thicker walls. The slightest disturbance was swiftly dealt with. And uh, they even used torture. Uh, and so you can imagine where that was a deterrent as well. People were fearful of the Roman authorities. And so Roman peace came at a price. Throughout Rome, the, there were great pagan temples that were erected. They were places of worship, but they were also places of networking. The people went to worship as a way of connecting with others, perhaps for business purposes, a way of getting their names out. And of course, it was also a, a way just to become part of the Roman culture. You know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And so... The problem was, these were pagan temples. And of course, whenever Rome moved into an area and took over, they allowed the people to keep their local gods, as long as they also adopted the Roman pantheon of gods, and of course, worshipped Caesar, worshipped the emperor, the one who gave himself the title, Lord and Savior. Now, to the Christian's ear, that is blasphemy, that a man, a mere mortal, would call himself Lord and Savior. Well, the Roman armies imposed peace and kept unity throughout the empire. Those were the days of Pax Romana, the Roman peace. To that culture, Paul writes these words, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so here we begin to understand the makeup 
of the church. You see, the church is composed of people that have been spiritually regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just reformed, but transformed. People that have experienced the miraculous new birth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul describes the former pre-Christian life as dead. He doesn't describe it as fun. He doesn't describe it as wild and free. He describes it as dead. He says, spiritually speaking, before you came to faith in Christ Jesus, you were dead. Your life was devoid of that which is true life. You were spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins. You had no purpose. You had no power. You had no ability to truly live. The idea is you were simply dragged along through life by powers that were beyond your control. And so the concept is, it's like a sailboat without a rudder. You're out there in the midst of the sea, and your sail is hoisted, but you have no rudder. You have no ability to control anything at all. You're simply being blown about upon the waves of humanity. It's a pretty desperate situation when you stop and think of it. And certainly any of us who are just intellectually honest with ourselves will admit that prior to coming faith in Christ Jesus, that is a perfect description of what our life is like. Just blown about and dragged along by passions and, and desires of the sinful nature of which we have no control over. We're just drug along. That's our life. No guiding purpose. Striving for satisfaction, but always coming up short. Now, you'd probably agree with me, those are pretty strong words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. I mean, he's not mincing words. He's saying, before Jesus, you were dead. Before Jesus, no power, no authority, no guiding purpose of your life. Before Jesus, you really could not live. But I want you to think for a moment that since the church was composed of all of these different people groups, and the church in Ephesus and in Asia Minor was primarily Gentile by this time, it would be very easy for the Jews in the congregation to say, he's not talking about us, he's talking about those Gentiles. Because <laughs> after all, we are the seed of Abraham. We are the chosen ones. We descended from Abraham. We are the ones who came from the chosen people. Certainly Paul is not talking about us. The Jews were proud. They had a proud lineage and a proud heritage. And yet Paul had no room and no toleration for smug self-righteousness. After all, this is the same Paul who said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. According to the law, I was faultless. In fact, I was a descendant from the tribe of Benjamin. And yet, what did he say? He said, my pedigree, I consider that to be dung when compared to the glorious riches of knowing Christ Jesus. So Paul had no room for self-righteousness, no room for a salvation of good works, no room for for an attitude that says, I don't really need God because I'm, I'm really not that bad. I mean, I haven't, I haven't killed anyone. Paul had no room for that kind of, of self-importance and self-righteousness. And so he continues, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So Paul goes from bad to worse. <laughs> he goes from difficult to desperate. And he describes their life as not only being dead, but he says not only were you spiritually dead, you were children of wrath. Not simply estranged from God, you were the enemy of God. 
carrying out the desires of your body, carrying out the desires of your mind, living in the passions of your old sinful nature, drug along, not able to control any of those desires, children of wrath. It's a desperate and despairing situation prior to faith in Jesus. Spiritually dead. Desperate. The Bible tells us the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. Another group of people, three here, that were in a desperate situation. They were living in Babylonian captivity during the time of the prophet Daniel, and wicked King Nebuchadnezzar was in charge. This man was such an egomaniac that he had a golden image of himself constructed that was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Can you imagine? I mean, every once in a while I'll be watching television and then I'll see over in the Middle Eastern countries where some new potentate is in charge. And the first thing that he does is he gets all the billboards in the land and has his face put on them has all these posters put up. I was over there in, in Saudi Arabia. It, it was ridiculous. You know, who is this guy? And yet that's the way it's done, especially in that part of the world. A statue of gold, nine stories tall and nine feet wide. And to make matters worse, the charge went out throughout the land that whenever they heard the royal music playing, and the statue coming by, they were to fall down and to worship the golden image. Of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made it perfectly clear they were not going to bow. What was the uh, punishment for the offense of not bowing? Well, you'll be thrown headlong into a fiery furnace to be instantly incinerated. Most people would bow, but not these three Hebrew young men who were standing for righteousness. They put their faith in God and they told the king, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And the king was incensed. And so without any haste, without any hesitation, I should say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bound and thrown into the fiery furnace. But before they were thrown in, this incensed king had the furnace heated seven times hotter than normal. In fact, it was so hot, the Bible says, that the servants who bound them and threw them in the furnace were themselves consumed by the heat, and they died. But after throwing them into the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar said, Look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a desperate situation, but God, who is rich in mercy, showed up and rescued them from the fiery furnace. You see, with God... No situation is without hope. Think about the children of Israel. By great signs and wonders, they were delivered from the taskmaster, Pharaoh. And they were led out into the wilderness under the leadership of Moses, and they, they came to the Red Sea. But as they were waiting to cross the Red Sea with that vast ocean in front of them, what happened? Pharaoh changed his mind. And he was pursuing them with his armies, the armies of Pharaoh breathing down the backs of the, uh, of the Israelis' necks. I mean, you could almost just feel the breath of their horses. But then God came through. And he parted the Red Sea so that the children of Israel could cross on dry land while the Egyptian army was destroyed. Because with God, no situation is without hope. Consider Peter. He's been thrown in the county jail for his testimony. And there he is in jail during a desperate time. Saul of Tarsus is persecuting the church. Stephen has been stoned. And here's Peter probably wondering, am I next? But God sends an angel and delivers Peter and sets him free because with God, there's never a situation that is without hope. 
And that's the whole point that the Apostle Paul is driving home to the Ephesian people here as he writes them this letter. He says, you were spiritually dead. You were enemies of God. You were enslaved by the desires of your sinful nature. You were desperate and without hope. And then he breaks through this desperation with these words. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Now there may be somebody here this morning that needs to hear that. You're in a desperate situation and you say, man, you're describing my life. I'm like that sailboat without a rudder. I'm driven by passions. I'm driven by desires of my sinful nature that I have no control over. And it's a desperate situation. How could God even love me? I, I'm an enemy of Him. I'm a, ch I'm a child of wrath. If that describes your situation, I want to encourage you to read this verse again. But God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Praise the Lord. You see, the Lord did not wait for us to get right. And I've talked to people over the years that that's how they feel. Well, if you just knew the person that I really am, I need to get a few things straight before I come to God. <laughs> That's like taking a shower before you take a shower. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. We cannot make ourselves good enough because we have sinned against a God who is holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. There's nothing that we can do in ourselves to make us righteous. In fact, the Bible says that our acts of righteousness are like filthy rags. Like filthy rags. So what are we to do? We are simply to throw ourselves on the mercy of God and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if we will come to terms with our sinfulness and throw ourselves on the mercy of God, He will receive us. He will adopt us into His family, forgive us of our sins, and wash us. That our sins, though they be as red as crimson, they will be as white as the driven snow. Praise the Lord. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Friends, it's all about God's love and God's grace. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. So the makeup of the church, uh, it's comprised of people from every tribe and every tongue who have this one thing in common. They've recognized that they are sinners and they have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of their sins and asking Him to be their Savior, to be their Lord. That's the makeup of the church. Those who are spiritually regenerated. Well, what about its mission? What is the mission of the church? And it's important for us to talk about the mission of the church because, like so many other things in our world today, this is a subject that has much confusion swirling around it. Lots of opinions about what is the mission of the church. It's kind of like Christmas. Something that drives me absolutely bonkers. I don't know if it bothers you or not, but it drives me nuts. When during the Christmas season, I'm watching television, you know, some Christmas show, and somebody will, you know, all the dialogue is going along, and then somebody will make the comment, well, you know, it's like the true meaning of Christmas. And I sit on the edge of my seat and I listen, waiting to hear them talk about Bethlehem and the child born to save mankind. And they never say that. The true meaning of Christmas. Tree, 
Gifts under the tree. The true meaning of Christmas. Love for your fellow man. The true meaning of Christmas. No, it's not. Now, I like getting gifts under the tree, and I think we should love our fellow man. But the true meaning of Christmas is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So when we come to the mission of the church, it's important that we understand what its mission is. How God defines the mission of the church, not popular opinion. Some people think that the mission of the church is to provide civic opportunities and social interaction. A place to make good, solid friends. Social club. Some people think that the mission of the church is to confront injustice and alleviate suffering. To champion the cause of the disfranchised and forgotten of our culture. To shape public policy. Now, I would say that all of those things are good things. And I would agree that the church should be uh, involved in giving people the opportunity to make good, solid, lifelong friendships. I think the church should be involved in confronting injustice and working to alleviate human suffering. I think the church should champion the cause of those who are disfranchised in our culture. Absolutely. I think the church, Christians, should shape com compassionate and just public policy. So it's not that I disagree with any of those things. It's just that those things are not the primary mission of the church. <laughs> All of that is secondary. And quite frankly, if we are to engage in those activities in a way that is proper, then they must spring from our primary mission. If those secondary things spring from our primary mission, then they can be good things. But if they don't spring from our primary mission, no matter how good they are in themselves, they will distract us from our mission. So, what is our mission? Well, prior to his ascension, Jesus gathered the disciples on the Mount of Olives and he gave the church its mission. These are probably among the most important words that the Lord ever said. I mean, he had these three, three and a half years of ministry and he was constantly teaching and saying things that were profound. But I have to believe he saves the best for the last. The disciples are about to watch Jesus ascend back to the Father, and you know that they're waiting to hear, well, what, what now? Now what do we do? What does Jesus say? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to uh, observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Make disciples. Go and make disciples. That's what we're supposed to do. And so if we can use some of these secondary means of impacting people and the Holy Spirit using that to get folks' attention so that we can share the love of Jesus Christ with them and make disciples, then I'm all for it. But if we're just, if we're just reaching out to the temporal needs of people and somehow thinking that that is the end, friends, we could get people warm and well-fed but still see them slip off into eternity apart from God without a relationship with the Lord. You see what I'm saying? It's important to reach out with the love of Christ but never at the expense of our primary mission of making disciples. Making disciples. And I'll tell you what, one of the biggest challenges that we have a, as a uh, challenge before us as a local church and that the church at large has had for these 2,000 years, we witness, we share the love of Jesus, we see people wonderfully converted, and then we fail to follow up with discipleship. And I want you to be praying with me that in the year ahead, our church will really make a priority of disciple making and begin to put in place some systems and some structures that will help us be intentional about making disciples. Amen? Because that is what we are called to do. And so when we look at this, what is uh, commonly referred to as the Great Commission of Jesus Christ, the Great Commission for the church, we distill it all down into a succinct statement, our mission statement as a church, leading people to a growing relationship with Christ. 
Say it with me. Leading people to a growing relationship with Christ. Now, I want you to notice that the characteristic of that relationship is what? Growing. A growing relationship. It's important for us to come to Christ. It's just as important for us to grow in Christ. In fact, God expects Christians to spiritually grow up. And friends, something that I've observed over my 50 years is that spiritual growth is not automatic. And that just because I'm growing older does not mean I'm growing up in the Lord. I've known some people who as teenagers are spiritually mature. I've known some people as aged people who are spiritual infants. Seriously. Been saved for 60 years. Still sucking on a bottle. And I'm not being mean, I'm just, I'm just being frank. This is what, I've uh, what I have observed, and I'm sure that you have too. We've got to be serious about growing in the Lord. Be serious about being children of the Word. Serious about yielding to the promptings of His Spirit so that we can grow up. You see, this was the situation that uh, James was talking about. He said, man, by now you ought to be off the milk. And yet we can't get past the foundational truths. And he's addressing saints that should have been mature by that time. So it's important to come to Christ, but it's equally important to grow in Christ. Our personal well-being depends upon it. But listen, the effectiveness of our church depends upon it as well. So how do we grow? Ephesians chapter 4 says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Someone might ask, what is the number one priority of First Baptist Church? And I would say, in my opinion, the number one priority, the perfecting of the saints. Number one. Because that is why God has given the ministry the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for what? The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. There are many things in this church that are important to us. Evangelism, outreach, world missions. All of those things are important to us. You know, making a positive impact in our community with the gospel. Joining together with other churches of like faith to make a greater impact. There are many things that are important to us as a church. But the number one priority the perfecting of the saints. You know why that's so important? Because as Christians grow and mature, as Christians are full, fully grown up, then all of these other things have a way of falling into place. When the saints are perfected, evangelism happens. When the saints are perfected, world missions is fully funded. When the saints are perfected, lives are changed. When the saints are perfected, God is glorified. You see, it's not about church growth. It's about church health. As we grow up in the Lord, we come to a place where He uses us in ways that we never dreamed possible. And that's why the mission statement is leading people to a growing relationship with Christ. So how does God mature His people? What methods does the Lord use in bringing spiritual maturity to the life of the Christian? I believe that there are two means. Equipping the saints and deploying the saints. Those are two broad categories. When you think about equipping the saints, two ways that God does that. The first is through the ministers of the church. And that is why he gave apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers. For what? The perfecting of the saints, the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. He uses the ministers to perfect the saints and he uses the members of the body of Christ. For as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You know, you've probably met people before that they say, well, I love God, but I hate the church. Love God, can't stand the church. Love God, don't go to church. Well, what do you do? Well, I just watch TV. I just watch church on TV. 
Now, some people are shut-ins and they don't have any choice, right? And so, praise God that there's some opportunities and options available. But friends, the church is made up of people. And people are not perfect. And we're going to encourage each other and we're going to get on each other's nerves. <laughs> you know? You don't have to pray for patience. Just be regular in church attendance. You'll get it. <laughs> You'll get patience, amen? <laughs> Why? Because we're people. We bump up against each other, right? But God uses the sandpaper of those circumstances to polish us and to help us to see that, you know what? Maybe I too great on other people sometimes. <laughs> Maybe I too am insensitive. Maybe I too get too busy doing things that are, you know, good, but I miss that which is best. And it helps us to look inward when we see the examples of others and how perhaps, you know, God is using them as, as an example for us of, of what to do and, and then at other times of what not to do. I was talking to a person the other day who was in a very difficult employment situation was relaying to me something that the boss was doing, and it's just kind of a, the whole tone and environment is just not really a, a great place to work. And you know what I said? I said, sometimes you're put in a place where the greatest lessons you learn are how not to do things. That if you're ever in a position of leadership, you'll know what you don't want to do because you've been on the receiving end, uh, you know, of a manager who's maybe a boss, and they haven't learned that, yeah, that works for a while, but if you really want to lead people, you need to get on the team like a coach and get out in front. And so God uses the ministers of the church to grow us. He also uses the members of the church to grow us. But then there's another way that God grows us, and that is through ministry. And so I want to just spend the last couple of minutes talking about the ministries of the church because... I'm going to tell you what, friends, I am a firm believer that there are, there are realities of spiritual maturity that we never attain to apart from our personal involvement in ministry. That we are saved to serve. That God has given us gifts, not so that we could just, you know, sit on them, but so that we could engage and it's as we get involved in ministry that we find that we are really growing. I can tell you something. When I am preparing to teach a, a class or when I'm preparing a sermon for a Sunday morning, I have to know the material much better than I would just in a private devotional life. Why? Because I've got to anticipate the questions that people are going to have. I've got to anticipate, well, how are they going to apply this to their own lives? And especially on Sunday night when we've got open dialogue and people will ask the questions. I had better have done some research and not just go in there and open the Bible and say, uh, okay, tonight this is what we're studying. And I grow because I'm using the gifts that God has given me. When you came in this morning, I'm sure that probably most of you had a sense of identity. Maybe you said, I'm a school teacher, I'm an electrician, uh, I'm a retiree, you know, fill in the blank. I I'm a husband or a wife, I'm a dad, I'm a mom, I'm a brother, I'm a sister. When you leave here, what I hope is that if you don't already have this sense of self-identity, that you'll leave saying, I am a minister that God has called each one of us as Christians. That if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, He's gifted you and He's called you to make a difference in the field where you're at. He wants to use you. Do you realize that you'll see people on a weekly basis that Pastor David and myself perhaps will never see? Neighbors, co-workers, associates, extended relatives, people who need Jesus. And God's got you there to be able to reach out and to minister His love and grace. As Christians, God has called us and equipped us for ministry. And so Paul continues this letter to the Ephesians. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's critical that we understand this passage because I'm going to tell you something. 
Because we are saved by faith in God's grace, one of the biggest mistakes that we in the evangelical world have made over the years is we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and we stop. We don't go on to verses 9 and 10. We just, we read verse 8. We like verse 8. For it's, you know, by, faith, by grace you are saved through faith, and that's a gift, not of yourself, not of good works, lest anyone should boast. Right? And we stop and say, see? <laughs> but we need to continue, because Paul continues and says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. And so a genuine faith leaves footprints. It takes its marching orders from the Lord and says, how can I serve you, Lord? Not because we're afraid of not being saved, but because we're so grateful for His love and mercy that we can't help but want to serve Him. There was a little boy who had a, an aunt, Aunt Eva, who had this goat. And this boy loved the goat. Aunt Eva just kind of tolerated the goat, but she kept it because she knew that the, the boy liked it. And this was a big goat, big enough that the boy could ride on it, and he rode on it all the time. But if there's one thing you know about goats is that they've got a voracious appetites and they'll eat anything. Well, as the azalea bushes came in, the prized azalea bushes that Aunt Eva loved, that old goat had a hunger pang. <laughs> you know what happened. He ate the azalea bushes. And when Aunt Eva discovered that the azalea bushes had been eaten, she decided that that goat was good for nothing. And the little boy said, the last time I saw that goat, he was being loaded up on a trailer, and I never did see him again. He was gone. Probably became dog food. <laughs> Friends, Christians are to be good for something. Amen? Good for something. So I want to encourage you this morning. Engage in ministry. Well, Pastor Greg, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Well... You are blessed to be a blessing, someone once said. And I believe that that's the truth, that you're saved to serve, that you are a member to be a minister, member of his body to be a minister. And so start with the things that interest you and get involved. And what you'll find is that as you get involved in ministry, you're growing spiritually and God is helping you to identify the areas that really light your fire and really encourage you and really build you up. And friends, it'll not only help you to grow and mature in the Lord, it'll help you to really enjoy the Christian life because you're not simply on a, a treadmill or a rat race like our world is. But you'll know that God has called you on purpose and for a purpose. The purpose that you might live your life in a way that brings glory to King Jesus and helps to engage in the ministry that he's called us to as the people of God. Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian of the 19th century, he said, Ephesians 2 begins with the spiritual state of the Ephesians before their conversion. It goes to the change which God had wrought in them and it leads to the design for which that change had been effected. In other words, we were made for ministry. Today, you might be actively involved in ministry, and if you are, I just want to say, God bless you, keep going. That's wonderful. And I've seen the, the smiles and the nods. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's hard work. Yeah, sometimes I go home tired, but it's a good tired. There's a satisfaction that comes from being engaged in the ministry of the church, what God has called us to. But then there may be others where you're, you're saying, you know what, I'm just kind of sitting on the sidelines. And I feel like my spiritual life has stalled. And maybe this morning I've discovered why. I need to get up and get active. Get involved in ministry. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. I believe as long as you're this side of heaven, God has a job for you to do. Amen. I mean, otherwise, he could just take us home. You know, we commit our lives to the Lord Jesus and boom, we're gone. We're out of here. But he leaves us.
and he equips us that we might grow and be productive members of his body. So as we close in prayer today, I just want to encourage you to make yourself available to the Lord because you'll find that when you're living for his purposes, there's no better way to live the Christian life. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for the love that you have shown us in Christ Jesus that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Today I pray, Lord, that you will help us to grow beyond our gratitude for grace, that we will grow to the place where we are engaging in the work of ministry that you've called us to. And then, Lord, as we continue to grow deeper in you, I pray that you would use us to make a greater impact in this community, an impact for the gospel, an impact for the kingdom of God, that Jesus might be glorified. And it's in his matchless name we pray. Amen.